one. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to another exciting episode of Delusions of Grandeur. I am one of your hosts, but uh, today we're going to go on ab about a dreaming movie. Well, well <laughs> it's not exactly Inception, but it is... <laughs> It, it it is a delightful fil uh, film that comes uh, uh, from the year 1947, and it stars Danny Kaye, Virginia Mayo, among others. Um, and uh, it is directed by Norman Z. Uh, I think it's uh, it's uh, pronounced McLeod. Um, and the screenplay is by, uh, by Ken England um, and Everett Freeman. Um, uh, but uh, there's a couple of other characters that uh, show up in this uh, uh, film, including Boris Karloff, the legendary. <laughs> so uh, um, I'm just going to do, uh, do a small synopsis here that... Uh, um, IMDb has, and it doesn't really give a whole lot, but it at least gives us something. A clumsy daydreamer gets caught up in a sinister conspiracy. <laughs> um, now, I, I I happen to have a copy of the film. Oh, cool. Um, and it's got uh, Samuel... Goldwyn signature up in the uh, uh, corner uh, there. Evidently, this film is so out of pr uh, print, it uh, goes for 30 40 bucks online. Mm. <laughs> so, um, it can be pricey when you want to try to find it. Um, but um, why don't we go with first impressions here? of the uh, the film what did you think of the fil uh, film first time around so yeah this was the first time i watched uh, this movie and uh, it was pretty cool it was uh, fun it had uh, some good humor i kind of got confused a few times but uh, what i didn't understand uh, you helped me so thank you for that uh, and uh, yeah, I guess I would, uh, uh, maybe I would have to see it once more in order to catch up on all the details, especially this uh, political part of the story, which we may get into later. But uh, yeah, it was uh, pretty good. Yeah, um, I watched, um, I ended up getting the, uh, this film from a friend of mine uh, here in Milwaukee. and. Uh, I was actually quite surprised that it was amongst his uh, his stuff that he uh, wanted to sell, and uh, I uh, I watched it the first time actually um, in its whole dexterity. I think that I've actually watched this film like in pieces before, like it's been on TCM or something like that, like sure. on TV while my uh, while my parents were watching it at one point in time, but I. Don't think I, I caught it from beginning to end. It, it was like one of those movies that, that they just so happened to be watching. And it, it was like I was not paying attention to it at the time. Because there are many films that our parents tend to watch that we probably were either more interested in homework or <laughs> doing something of that nature. And uh, um I don't think I, 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 during the beginning years of my life, I, I was so intent on studying film like I am now. So seeing this film in its entire uh, entirety the other uh, night, I had to really turn around once I'd seen it and show it to you. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, it was pretty good. <laughs> and it just so happens that this film has a, a sort of a remake, um, um, which we'll get to next week. But uh, but um, cool. I had seen that one, uh, the other one, before I'd seen this one. 
Oh, so you saw the remake first. I saw the remake first, and I didn't even know that there was a, 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 an original until I saw it amongst my my fr uh, my friend's stuff to sell, and I was like, mm, wait a minute. I, I, I've seen this title before. Uh, before I did not realize there was a, an original f f f film that it was based on. and mm. So I watched it, and I had to, uh, to say that I giggled several times. Uh, I, and I, when I say giggle, I, 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 I mean giggle, because I, I had to laugh. It wasn't like a, like a burst out laughing, but I, uh, but I chuckled. Uh, a, a little bit, a bit at the uh, couple of songs, that, and uh, and there's obviously some slapstick humor that uh, that Danny Kay um, uh, knew enough to look like this bumbling idiot uh, that was walking around. You know, I mean, he was clumsy, <laughs> yeah, and purposely so. So, um, what did you think about um, Walter Mitty uh, as a character? Well, I would say he is a very interesting character, and I uh, have to say I found him uh, somewhat relatable, since uh, I am also a bit of a daydreamer, maybe not to his extent, like I don't uh, get so lost in my fantasy that I don't know uh, what's fantasy and what's real, but... Uh, uh, I'm an unpublished writer, as you probably know, so uh, I do like to uh, come up with stories and things like that. And uh, I do know the feeling of uh, uh, fantasy being more interesting than reality. So yeah, I can uh, uh, I can kind of understand him in these moments when. Uh, that things he deals with in real life are just boring and he gets lost in his fantasies. Uh, that, uh, uh, well, and he's got a lot of people in his li uh, life that seem uh, seem to want to co uh, control his life. Uh, some of them are using him. You know, you know uh, if, if you look at it from a, a standpoint where, I mean, he's got his mother who's always uh, telling him how to live. Basically, basically, uh, <laughs> right now in this mo moment, he, he, she is controlling his every uh, moment to uh, to, uh, to get uh, to the marriage bed. You know, I mean, <laughs> it, it, literally, <laughs> literally. I mean, uh, she's mm -hmm. telling him, "Go get this, go get that. Uh, uh, don't uh, don't forget that." You know, you know the uh, things of that nature, and it, it's like if I had to deal with a mother like that, I would kill her. <laughs> like no uh, one uh, like, like I would literally make sure that she uh, she had uh, uh, was found in several different pieces. <laughs> I, I I would literally become Norman Bates. Yes, <laughs> but uh, but uh, uh, it's funny that you mentioned Norman because. Uh, um, there are some motherly-like tendencies here that kind of, sort of, remind you of Norman Bates' mother, doesn't she? Uh, yeah, for a moment I was reminded of her uh, in one of those scenes when she was uh, bossing Walter around. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, that being said, what do you think of uh, uh, his mother? Uh, do you think uh, that you would like her for a mother? Uh, well, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, probably not. Uh, although, uh, I did get the impression that she uh, wasn't really inherently bad. Maybe she just... Uh, it wasn't really, it didn't really know her son very well and didn't realize that he... Or didn't really know how to mother all that well. You never well, know. I mean, uh, yeah. there is a right way and a wrong way to mother someone, and I, I don't think it's to smother one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You smother the child, you get, you get a claustrophobic, paranoid psychopath. <laughs> or, I mean, or, you know, I mean, 
you have to wonder at some uh, uh, some of these mothers that are portrayed in these films. Um, what did you think about the fiance? Well, uh, I liked her puppy. If nothing else, uh, it was cute. <laughs> uh, yeah, but uh, uh, I don't think I would like to be the puppy if I were to uh, to be dressed. And at the table, every single moment of every single life, I, yeah. I think the I think the people who dress their uh, their, their pets are stupid. Myself, <laughs> I mean, why would why would a dog want to wear anything but his fur? I mean, uh, they were uh, they, uh, they. I don't know. It's just weird. Uh, I know that people dress their uh, their pets. I mean, I know that pe uh, you see people dressing them in pumpkins for Halloween and all that jazz. <laughs> uh, and some people uh, dress them up like little elves for Christmas and shit like that, you know? And, yeah. But I think it's it's embarrassing, uh, 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 to be honest. And uh, I see no reason to do it. I mean, I, I, I and for some reason, the people who... Uh, uh, do that also dote on their pets like come here little snooky welcome come here come to mama come to mama come to mama you know uh, 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 they dote on their uh, their pets way too fucking much i mean um uh, have you ever seen anyone who, uh, who dotes on their pets like that well, not uh, not quite like that. Uh, at least I haven't uh, met anyone like that uh, personally, but I have heard of many people like that. Uh, well, don't you say that about my mittens. Oh, <laughs> mittens, what did, did that person hurt you? <laughs> well, uh, I do know some people who are very emotionally attached to their pets, but uh, not like this. <laughs> Oh, uh, well, uh, won't leave, uh, won't go anywhere without them. Um, they, they'll sit at the table with them, and uh, 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 they'll uh, they'll do their nails just like they were their girlfriends sitting next to them. Um, no, I don't know anyone like that. <laughs> uh, I guess the most. Uh... Uh, the most extreme example I can think of when it comes to people I know in real life, uh, I know one uh, lady who would, uh, if she uh, gets a phone call from her family while she is at work and if someone tells her that something is wrong with her dog, uh, she will uh, storm out of her work and go home to uh, make sure the dog is okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, yeah, that's uh, kind of all I know in real life. <laughs> well, in any case, uh, what do you think about uh, 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 Walter's relationship with Little Queenie there? <laughs> well, it looks like they didn't really get along with each other. Uh, I think if I understood correctly, in one of his uh, fantasies, he saw some... Uh, uh, a woman barking, which was probably induced by his experience with this dog. <laughs> well, I do believe that the person who was barking w uh, was, in fact, the actress that played his fiance's mother. Oh, uh, oh, could be. <laughs> I, I didn't recognize her, but uh, yeah, possibly. Well, um, what did you think about uh, Walter's relationship with his fiance? Well, it uh, definitely looked like they uh, uh, they wouldn't really function together. Like it was uh, like their relationship seemed to be more uh, forced by their mothers, and uh, uh, yeah, it was obvious that uh, Walter didn't real wasn't really in love with her, and. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it seemed to be a relationship of plutonics, uh, where uh, just both controlling mothers just were like entirely best friends, and they wanted to marry off their uh, their uh, their son and the, uh, their daughter. Uh, and 
I know that she was having some marriage doubts because she kept getting um, uh, uh, getting marriage proposals by this tubby, uh, which apparently comes into play uh, uh, later on. What did you, what did you think of Tubby? He showed up several times in some of his fantasies too. Um, in what in the one with the uh, um, uh, where he was the army ca uh, captain, it just so happened uh, that he was one of the officers that was cheering him on, and uh, he ended up being that poker player that he pl uh, played against l uh, later on in another one of his fa fancies. But the, uh, all of his girl, dr uh, his all of his girl of his dreams all looked like this. Uh, mysterious woman that he ends up coming across. <laughs> what, what did you think of uh, Madame Van Hoom? Oh, well, she was uh, definitely pretty nice. <laughs> and uh, uh, I was originally a little confused about uh, this situation that uh, he, uh, uh, he keeps having fantasies about a woman looking uh, uh, like that, and then he suddenly meets uh, uh, a woman who looks exactly like that. Uh, uh, but yeah, then I realized it was supposedly a coincidence. But uh, uh, I have to say I found uh, the whole concept uh, pretty interesting. It uh, reminded me a bit of a movie we discussed before, which I like quite a bit, uh, John Bowker's Dreamwalkers. Uh, okay, I can see that. <laughs> Which is an entirely much lower bu uh, budget uh, 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 film, but it's still a good uh, film. Yeah, um, yeah, definitely. And uh, uh, the only thing is, is that his dream, uh, his dream world, is one of his fantasies, and uh, and not one that uh, that uh, um, he ended up finding himself in. So uh, yeah, he had those uh, recurring dreams of a woman who didn't exist in real life. Uh, I can see the uh, the parallel with uh, with uh, with that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but in any case, there is a somewhat political uh, 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 espionage. Uh, and when I say espionage, it means an adventure uh, or something done in secret, uh, secret where evidently there's this book that has uh, some Dutch crown jewel, uh, jewels, uh, or at least the... Uh, the the whereabouts of these Dutch crown jewels and some stuff that was stolen from this Dutch government during the or during World War II from the Nazis. Um, what, what did you think about that whole situation? I know that you found it a little confusing. Um, <laughs> why did you find it a little confusing? Because uh, uh, I know that um, we had this Madame Van Hoom uh, uh, kiss uh, our w Walter Mitty on a train because uh, she was being followed by this man with a knife. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, uh, there were uh, quite several things I found confusing, like uh, uh, until near the end, from what I understood, we didn't even know what that book was about and why it was so important until uh, they said it had something to do with the Dutch government and so on. Well, uh, he, he did, um, Walter did allude to telling us a little bit of what, about what the book was about by reading some of the uh, th mm. things while he was at that uh, yeah, uh, where he ended up eating some doggy bones. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, he did. <laughs> but he didn't know that that uh, that was the book. Uh, uh, that book. Uh, he thought it was uh, uh, the other book that he had. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the one where he was uh, 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 writing notes down about what he had to do for his mother. I think. <laughs> Yep, but he also used it, I think, for notes to do with his uh, 
his editing job that he has, which we haven't even alluded to, because Walter Mitty, in fact, works for uh, Pierce Publishing uh, House, which is a uh, magazine that, uh, that runs Pulp Fiction magazines, uh, 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 which the, uh, uh, some of them ha have sizzling mystery stories or jungle captives or sea uh, 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 things dealing with the, uh, the sea vampires. Kind of kind of like a, a whole co a comic book graphic book, uh, a graphic novel type, th you know. Yeah. And I think EW Comics uh, used to put, put out Tales from the Crypt, that kind of, uh, uh, that kind of magazine. Um, and uh, he's the editor for, uh, for this uh, dude, but um, the dude that he works for ends up stealing all of his ideas and taking them as his own. So what do you think of uh, his boss? Well... <laughs> I uh, I definitely wouldn't uh, like a person who does that. I mean, as I mentioned before, I'm a writer myself, and I would be pretty upset if someone did that to me. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, uh, Walter Mitty has been working for this guy for t uh, for eleven years, and. Uh, been using his ideas as his own or taking credit for it and uh we see some of that, uh, that. so uh, he's he's a little seedy a, a little seedy when it comes to, uh, to walter and he's also very controlling and very demanding of walter as well so uh, so not only does he have his mother his his future stepmother-in-law or uh, uh, the future mother-in-law and uh, his boss, you know, he's got all these people basically hounding him his entire life. Uh, it, yeah. It's no wonder that he's daydreaming about better lives. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> um, but um, he ends up meeting a woman who, who is... Uh, apparently on the run from someone and she kisses him and then again uh, she kisses him again and uh, she ends up uh, 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 she ends up taking him along to meet someone so that she feels safe and this someone ends uh, ends up giving him this book that uh, well he slips it in his satchel and uh, he mistakes it for his own book uh, but but this guy who gives it to him is mysteriously stabbed in the cab that they uh, they, uh, they were in. So when uh, 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 he gets involved in this murder subplot, where uh, where this uh, this guy has been murdered, uh, evidently there are some people looking for a book, which apparently they now think that he has it. So now uh, and, and mm. so now uh, now eventually, Madame Van Hoom, uh uh, uh, takes him to what she thought was her uncle, and he tell, uh, tells him that, well, what do you think of this person that uh, that uh, passes himself off as the uncle? Well, uh, 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 I uh, I didn't suspect he might be the bad guy until it was revealed. Uh, Later on, that was a uh, well. At least to me, it was a pretty unpredictable plot twist. Uh, well, and like I said, uh, this whole uh, political subplot was uh, a little confusing to me. But uh, I guess he is a, a generic villain who wants to uh, uh, who wants to. Uh, uh, get his hands on some uh, fortune by illegal means. Uh. Correct. And uh, this Van uh, Van Horn is in fact uh, in fact Rosalind Van Horn. Um uh, but there is another character in here called Dr. Hugo Hollingshead which is played oh. by the illustrious Boris Karloff. <laughs> 
<laughs> which I like. I like the fact that he showed up here because his voice is ultimately creepy. <laughs> no, no, no matter how you hear it. I mean, um, I, I've i known him from many, many different uh, uh, films and many, di many different series. And he's just... He, he just comes off as uh, uberly creep, uh, creepy anyways. I mean, when you first see him on the screen here, I mean, he comes bearing the gift of uh, a possible murder plot that uh, that um, Mitty could possibly use for, you know, one of his stories. Yeah. And, and the fact that he comes towards him with his hands, uh, uh, hands and then he completely acts like he wasn't <laughs> uh, yeah, well. about to strangle him or push his uh, push his temples to each other mm, yeah, <laughs> he did try to murder him there yep and uh, he ends up being a, a part of the plot later where he he just ends up being like one of the goons that uh, um is kind of one of uh, one of the people that is helping this uh, this person that uh, that is called the boot which mm. i'm i'm wondering if there was uh, was ever a character by the name of peter van horn i wonder if uh, if that was just another way to um make make rosalind think that it was her uncle when in fact it was the boot that uh, that was uh involved i don't know they don't uh, they don't uh, they don't necessarily allude to whether uh, whether um whether peter van horn was the person that the book was originally going to uh or, or when he supposedly disappeared and the boot took his place we don't necessarily know that right uh, yeah, yeah, that was one of the reasons why I found that uh, part of the story a little confusing. Uh, yeah. Maybe, maybe I would understand it better if I watched the movie once more, <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> uh, I agree. Uh, I agree. Um, now, from what I understand, uh, um, from, oh, let's see... There were two songs in here that I thought were quite funny, which makes it part musical. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. There was, um, well, well, let's see. The reason why I say it's part musical is because there, um, there is a song that was sung um, during one of his daydreams called Symphony for Unstrung Tongue. And it, it, and it was by Sylvia Fine, but it was performed by Danny Kay himself. And that song is fucking hilarious. He is supposedly um, passing himself off, uh, off as this music teacher that, that was from Germany or something like that. And um, just how he, how fast he sang and uh, how just gibberish the the song was <laughs> <laughs> yeah the songs were pretty fun <laughs> what did you think about about that first song there uh, well uh, uh, i remember i uh, while i was watching it i remember laughing at them but i since i have seen it only once i didn't memorize the lyrics but uh, well i, I, I don't think anyone I... could really memorize the lyrics like he did <laughs> <laughs> yeah probably <laughs> i mean do you remember the czechoslovakian name of the composer I don't think so. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, neither can I. I mean, I and I've seen it twice. Uh, but um, uh, and then the second song was actually during the daydream while he was listening to a guy who designs hats for a living. And in a sense, it was a satire, a song that was uh, making fun of the man who makes hats uh, and, yeah. 
And not only were the hats that the, uh, the guy created ugly as sin, so were, so were the hats that we uh, see in this song. And they're much more uh, funnier because uh, there, uh, there's a hat that uh, he says was a two-room uh, two apartment. And he, he takes off the top and uh, he tells that there, uh, there's, okay, here's a, a room, here's a bathtub, you know. <laughs> mm. um, there's one that looks like the uh, Leaning Tower of Pisa. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, and there's one that's just made of straw, you know, and it's just he's making fun of the uh, the guy who's making the hats by making more hats that uh, uh, that are like impossible, <laughs> <laughs> and it's done through a song called Anatole of Paris, which is also uh, uh, evidently written by Sylvia Fine as well. Uh, but it was performed by uh, Danny Kay. And then, of course, there's the music uh, that is throughout here. It's a, uh, uh, it's a classical piece uh, 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 by Stephen Foster. And uh, it, it was uh, performed and uh, written in uh, 1862, in fact. Uh, and it's a, a song called Beautiful Dreamer. Oh. And, and it was played uh, uh, at first by Virginia Mayo, the actress in here, um, in, in the film. And then later she used it as a a, a cue for him to come da uh, downstairs to, uh, to see him. And then you also hear it playing in the background sometimes when they uh, when they get together. So it's kind of like it, it, it's kind of like their signature song. What did yeah. you think about uh, the Beautiful Dreamer song? Well, it, uh, uh, from what I heard, it uh, did sound pretty nice. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it, it, it's cool, this uh, concept of them having their I iconic song. Uh, I uh, kind of uh, uh, do that uh, in my writing. I mean, when uh, I write a story, I often look for music with lyrics that uh, remind me of my characters or some scene in the story or something like that. It, uh, uh, it helps me with my inspiration. Uh, it's very good. Uh, I mean, often times you, you don't think of, uh, uh, think of uh, uh, that. I mean... Uh, during like the 50s and 60s and, uh, and the 40s, I think uh, um, it was a kind of iconic to have um, a specific song that uh, that or music that uh, that would make you know uh, make known that the character was entering the room or in the room or or whether they were together. Sometimes they do it. Um, as noticeably as it was in here, or sometimes they uh, they do it sporadically, but uh, but in here I think it worked pretty nicely. So, yeah, uh, and it, I don't think it was used entire. Although uh, I do have to say, uh, whenever uh, uh, whenever you, uh, you heard pockety puck pockety puck. The, uh, that that was used a little bit too much. <laughs> I, at least I, I feel uh, those were, uh, uh, but um, I liked the fact that th uh, this uh, film was just kind of mad whack. You know, I mean, it didn't just uh, go here. It, it went like several different places before it finally, you know, brought the story to uh, to. Uh, a happy ending, you know? Uh, yeah. And uh, I like the fact that the characters were over the top. <laughs> Especially uh, while they were, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> um, is there anything that you, uh, you'd like to uh, say about this film that you, that, uh, 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 that, that you haven't already said? Oh, <laughs> 
Well, uh, 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 I remember I found uh, quite several scenes funny, like uh, when they were trying to retrieve the book and they uh, they knocked on the door of this one guy and uh, uh, when, they, uh, when Walter tried to ask for the book, he was mentioning this uh, 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 corset where he had... Uh, 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 left the book in while he was at uh, that place. What was it? I forgot. Uh, yeah, the uh, uh, the uh, one, uh, right before mm. that that they were looking in the phone book for uh, for the name of the lady in which he had left the course uh, 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 the book in a course that which was being sent to Miss Follingsworth or Follingswood or something, uh, something like that. Something like that. Uh, well, it, it turns out that uh, that the first lady they came ac across was at an address that uh, that had a man who, who evidently was quite uh, quite jealous of his uh, his wife, as as though when he knocks on the door a door, the man ultimately opens the door already, and he knocks on his chest instead of the door. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was. Uh, and he bothers him again, and he's like, "Why? Uh, if you knock on this door one more time, I'm gonna give you, uh, give it to you, Buster." Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, that's when uh, apparently the uh, the delivery the, yeah. yeah the delivery man <laughs> shows up, and he gets the he gets the. He gets <laughs> he gets knocked out of the park there, uh, there for a moment. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that is a funny moment. Uh, I, I mean, uh, you have to admit, admit that Danny K, K he, he he can be he can uh, he can be funny. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, uh, and I mean uh, uh, a lot of uh, what happened in that scene was. Uh, caused by the way Walter was uh, wording his request, like when he uh, tried to say what he was really there for, he uh, started to, to mention the guy's uh, wife's corset and so <laughs> on that made it sound like he had an affair with her or something like that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> they... There were definitely some funny moments that uh, that Dan K brought to, uh, brought to uh, the table here. Um, I like uh, well, I'm I'm. We've kind of talked about the uh, the plot a little bit. I mean, he meets her on the train. Uh, uh, train. He he uh, he gets involved in this uh, sub murder plot and this uh, cr these crown jewels and. Evidently, these people are after that, that, uh, them, and there's this whole pl uh, plot, w uh, you know, that she's trying to do everything for her uh, 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 for her uncle, and her uncle is after this book. And when she realizes that she uh, he is not her uncle, uh, she uh, she, uh, uh, she tries to get the, uh, them an escape route. He gets drugged, and uh, when he wakes up, you know, they try uh, they try to. Uh, Make it seem like his delusions are, uh, 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 his delusions made him think that uh, uh, that Rosalind wa was in fact real. I mean, they even had that moment in Doctor Hollingsworth office, uh, where he he basically has him lay in the chair and he or or lay in a, on one of those doctor couches. <laughs> Yeah, the, yeah. And, and he basically spins this tale about about how there uh, there was this man who th uh, thought that he saw someone in a bathing suit. What does the nurse do? She shows up in a bathing suit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, he kind of performed some uh, uh, rather clever magic tricks to uh, make Walter think he was insane. Mm hmm. So, but he also sees Rosalind uh, 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 partially. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, then, of course, uh, he's at his marriage. Oh well, uh, I have to mention uh, uh, this part where uh, where Rosalind shows up at his home and uses the music to bring him down. His mom and uh, his fiance and her mo uh, mother all end up like getting awakened 
because of the <laughs> music. And the, uh, then, of, co of course, he's made some tea for, uh, tea for Rosalind. So that thing whistles, and uh, they, they wake again. And <laughs> it's just yeah. kind of a funny moment because it's like, uh, the the fiance is like, well, will he do this after we are married? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, kind of a moment. So, uh, so she's like, uh, I wonder if I'm making a bad choice. Mm. Yeah, it took her some time to start thinking about that. <laughs> and I do kind of like the moment where uh, where. Um, He's arrived at at the at the at the home after after he's left the wedding, and he he he's gotten he's gotten through uh, through the room with help by someone up the window, um, uh, and uh, he's uh, he runs into the guy with the knife, and uh, it, 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 he puts his hand in his pocket and he's like. Now look at here, but uh, uh, buddy boy, I've got a German Luger in my pocket here. <laughs> you know, yeah, I mean, those aren't the exact words, but uh, uh, but, but you get my point. Yeah, like he he he, he, uh, he actually gets some nerve instead of uh, being like this nervous nilly. He actually has the balls to fight back. You know. Uh, yeah, and I think he was actually bluffing about having some weapon, right? Right. Um, and mm -hmm. uh, he ends up clocking him uh, one on the back of the he head. Which is <laughs> funny. And, and, then, and then he, he gets uh, Rosalind, and then he uses some of the... Uh, like, I li like the fact that he used some uh, uh, that buzzer. Um, he tied the buzzer to, uh, to the doorknob, and uh, and yeah, it was something in his in the magazine, but he buzzed himself too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that kind of reminded me of some uh, Home Alone traps, uh. right? <laughs> you almost wonder if uh, the director of that movie actually uh, um, got um, uh, got, uh, got uh, uh, that uh, from this movie or something like that. But anyways. <laughs> <laughs> what were what were some of your uh, favorite scenes? If uh, w was your favorite scene that uh, that jealous husband thing? Uh, I I think it was. I think that was the part where I laughed the most, uh, from what I remember. I have to say, the first time that I saw this, I think that I laughed the most at that uh, professor song of music, um, and oh. then. The second time I laughed was the hat song, the Anatole of, uh, of Paris or whatever. Yeah, the songs were pretty good. <laughs> but um, I actually found, uh, find this whole movie hilarious uh, in, in a sense. I mean, this was obviously a more lighthearted film, but, uh, but because it was still on that edge of the espionage noir age of film, I think it had a little bit of everything. It had, it had a little bit of horror. It had a, a, a little bit bit of, you know, uh, comedy, and it, it had a little bit of self awareness uh, uh, because this guy was like a, a total nervous like idiot <laughs> in, the, in the beginning of the uh, uh, film, and he ends up. Well, Finding his own balls of courage, and uh, all for the sake of you know Rosalind, and um, he finds out that you know everybody is just out for themselves, at least in his life, and he tells them that. I mean, that last l little moment where he's like, "Shut up! Yeah. <laughs> all of you are just so uh, so used to jump uh, jumping to." Uh, to conclusions, and then he finally let Tubby have it. <laughs> yeah, uh, I actually found that moment pretty good. I mean, um, I think uh, when he started to realize, uh, I mean, started to imagine uh, Rosalind in place of, uh, 
uh, what was her name? Uh, Gertrude. Gertrude. Yeah. Gertrude. Oh my God, such an ugly name. <laughs> oh, that, uh, that reminds me of uh, 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 of a joke with some of my online friends. Uh, <laughs> Uh, they actually made a joke about that name uh, before. Uh, so I mean, this one uh, uh, group with some uh, uh, online friends, and we have one guy who uh, uh, who really hates when he is watching something and he runs into spoilers. So, and then uh, he was watching this one anime show called uh, Fate Stay Night. Not sure if you have maybe heard of that. But... I have heard of it. It's an animated, uh, it's an anim a Japanese animation. Yes, yes. Uh, In and, fact, uh, uh, I could have gotten it for uh, the whole thing for relatively che uh, cheap uh, on oh. a sale re re real recently, but I just didn't have the money for it. Oh, I get it. Uh, so uh, uh, another guy from the group uh, 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 pulled a prank on this guy who hates spoilers. He said something, uh, 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 spoiler alert, uh, uh, Gertrude is uh, Saber's sister. I think something like that, he said. But the joke was the Gertrude character doesn't exist. He made her up and then... Uh, this guy got upset at first, but then we told him, hey, relax, it's a joke. And then uh, the name Gertrude became uh, uh, synonymous with uh, fake spoilers, and we started to make jokes about that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but uh, in case anyone named Gertrude is watching this uh, stream, uh, we mean no offense or disrespect to you. No, I guess in the, in reality, I I don't really. But uh, but in my honest uh, honest opinion, I guess I don't th think that Gertrude or Gertie are are uh, entirely that pretty of a name. So I am sorry if I have offended any Gertrudes or Gerties out there. But uh, I just uh, I don't feel, in all honesty and opinion, that I would ever name my child or children if i ever have any which i don't think i will uh, <laughs> i'm i'm old enough and fat enough to uh, to say oh. that i uh, i probably will not have any children oh, but, man. Uh, but um well i i at one time may have wanted some but uh, uh, but uh, my fiance uh, the one that i fell in love with uh she had a heart attack when I, as she was 36 and and this was before i met her um so i don't think that her health could t uh, ever t uh, um ever allow her to have any kids so uh, oh well i'm really sorry that's okay uh, i love her with all of my heart and uh, you know, you, you deal with uh, whatever, you, uh, you know, things are your way, you know, so, but uh, that's okay. Uh, I can be a kid till I'm 80, so, <laughs> <laughs> and still enjoy the films of my childhood and, well, hope, uh, and hope that I eventually get unfat somehow and uh, still enjoy the rest of my li uh, life. Uh, and just watch other kids grow up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, some people say I'm childish too, and I, uh, I also have some uh, movies that I liked in my childhood that I could uh, still watch again, and I wouldn't get bored of them. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. So, in any case, uh, let us. Uh... Uh, well, we did talk about the music, so, uh, so that's uh, uh, cool. Um, wh what did you think about the production and the uh, and the effects? Do you think that uh, they did a pretty good job at uh, showing us his daydreams? Uh, well, uh, actually, yeah, they did. And uh, uh, one thing that uh, really surprised me was to see a movie uh, this uh, old, uh, big in color. I mean, I thought all movies that were made back then were made in black and white. Well, 
uh, I knew that some movies were colored later, but I thought uh, uh, the movies back then uh, were being made in black and white. But then you told me that this movie was actually made in color, so uh, that was uh, kind of new to me when I found out. Well, that's the misconception. I mean, uh, color first came uh, came into play. Uh, I mean, back in the thirties, uh, I believe, oh. and uh, it's just not every single film uh, ended up going that uh, going that route. I mean, there are still films not to, the, uh, to this day that are still made in black and white um, because that's what people prefer. So, uh, some people prefer that. Um, yeah, I'm one of those few that uh, that seem to prefer a, a film to be black and white. Uh, um, I, I mean, David Lynch's Eraserhead wasn't black and uh, white. His Elephant Man was in black and white. Uh, um, there uh, um, have been s uh, several recent uh, f uh, films that I know were in black and white. Um, like Here is Hell, I think, is uh, uh, one that was recent, <laughs> or mm. something like that. Uh, that that one was a cool one. Um, but um, yeah, um, I I I relatively look for films that are done in bla black and white if they are, uh, because a lot of people tend to like to uh, portray the 50s and 60s sometimes so mm. technicolor i mean even um even the wizard of oz was part black and white or or part sepia and part color uh, you see what i mean yeah yeah and Good that point. was a film that was filmed in 1939 and believe it or not at the time that film was not well received. It wasn't until oh. until uh, the uh, the uh, the 50s that uh, when it came to television that people actually uh, started to enjoy it. And then uh, now it's become one of the most loved films of all time. So it's really weird because many of the films that were not really well thought of back then are now considered cult classics to this day so <laughs> well indeed uh, that uh, can kind of give some uh, hope to some people whose uh, work has not been <laughs> well received yet uh. <laughs> um you never know i mean uh, there, there are um the works that uh, that, uh, that you like that are independent oh, um, yeah. to the lover of the shot on video uh there it has its own special niche or, or corner of the of the a uh, corner of um appreciators uh people who appreciate the film uh or films and uh you'll either love them or hate them so uh, so um, and I happen to love watching shot on video films. I may not love I may not love every single independent film that I see. Um, and there may be some things that I can point out in some of the films that we have watched that probably other people would point out and not like. So. <laughs> Well, in my case, uh, I may have mentioned it in some previous discussions we've had, I'm not sure, but uh, you probably know that uh, my interest in shot on video movies began with uh, John Bowker's The Seekers, uh, which was the first uh, shot on video movie that I have ever seen. And... Uh, uh, you know, I grew fond of it because of the main actress, uh, and at first, uh, at first, I was just interested in uh, watching the other movies she played in. But uh, then, as I saw uh, uh, those few other movies with her, I uh, kind of started to uh, I learned to appreciate uh, the work of independent filmmakers. I realized that uh, they are 
doing what they're doing uh, not because they expect to make great profit from it but they are doing it because they love it and they they put a lot of uh, effort and enthusiasm into it and uh, they do the best they can with the usually limited resources they have at their disposition and that was something i learned to admire Correct, and uh, some of them do that, uh, and some of them uh, show you that they have <coughs> put enough energy and enough love into making these films that you can look past some of the mistakes that uh, some of these films make and, uh, in fact, uh, love them for it. Exactly. And to me, independent films are like the building blocks of film history and film history is always being made so to uh, so to me the act of watching some of these independent films is like watching the footsteps of future film history so uh, and each year i mean some of the films either are better or worse you know it's 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 up to the viewer whether they like them or not or not if you're entertained then uh, and you didn't fall asleep through it <laughs> i mean to me that shows that you enjoy it if you uh if you nitpick through the film and you don't fall asleep then at least you enjoyed it in some respect, you know? Uh, to, to me, if you have the time to nitpick, then obviously it has a garnered in you some kind of reaction, which means you must have liked it in some regards because you finished the damn movie, didn't you? <laughs> well, it did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> If you yeah, actually man. watch a movie from start to finish, obviously something entertained you. Whether it uh, gave you a feeling of disgust or displeasure, it doesn't matter. You finished it. You must have liked something. Otherwise, you would have quit watching it beforehand. There are films that I've turned on, watched the first couple of minutes, I've turned back off again. <laughs> well, Because they're uh, just that bad. Sometimes. Uh, maybe it has happened to me sometimes. Uh, I'm not sure, but yeah, I'm usually, I would say, pretty open-minded. Uh, I'm open-minded uh, too, uh, uh, too, and that's why I, f I figured uh, we'll go through as many movies as we possibly can in our <laughs> lifetime. As long as you were able to, unless you get married to some fishmonger uh, 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 down the street or something like that before uh, <laughs> before we finish. <laughs> but um, I, I, that's why I get, uh, give each of these fil uh, films uh, uh, at least a, a one-time watch. Um, and uh, some of them I've watched before and just want to share them with you or this one. Okay, I watched it once, but uh, but I liked it enough that I wanted to share it with you, and the, and I liked this. I, li I liked this one. Oh, uh, that's the remake. That's right? the remake, correct? Um, and I have it sitting here so that we can wa uh, watch it next week. So. <laughs> oh, that would be cool. <laughs> that way, I don't put it away and uh, be like, okay, where did I stick that movie again? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's good. Uh, I can also. Uh, I also have a tendency of misplacing things. Uh, well, and Danny K. Um, was this your first film seeing Danny K. in anything? Uh, probably yes. Okay, yeah, I've seen him in several things before. One of his more serious films was a movie called Hans Christian Andersen. And I don't have it as of yet, but I would like to eventually acquire a copy of it uh, because it was uh, a movie about the life, uh, uh, the life story of Hans Christian Andersen. Well, um, yeah. And he was a storyteller and he told the original story of The Little Mermaid. Uh, yeah, and the many other stories. Uh... Correct. And um, so he is the singer of that musical as well. Well, he also 
um, played in a Christmas movie called White Christmas. Oh, uh, let's see. Let's see what uh, what else he, he has pl uh, played in. Uh, I'm just looking uh, actor wise. Oh. Huh. I guess he died in 1987, but he was he was born in 1911, so he was 76 years old. I was, I'm just looking at uh, his uh, thing. Okay, so he he started up with Up in Arms in 1944, but his debut was. Uh, successful, and he continued to make hit movies such as The Secret Life of Walter Mitty. I, I know I have The Inspector General, um, which was filmed in 1949. That's right, and it uh, uh, says White Christmas. Um, evidently, he played an intense Holocaust survivor in a movie called Skokie in 1981. And evidently, he played a goofy dentist in an episode of The Cosby Show in 1984. <laughs> um, but um, he's been in quite a few f uh, f f films. Let's see. So he was in short films, Dime a Dance, Getting an Eyeful, Cupid Takes a Holiday, Money on Your Life, and Autumn Laughter, and then he was in Up in Arms, then he was in Wonder Man, he was in The, uh, the Kid from Brooklyn, The Secret Life of Walter Mitty, A Song is Born, It's a Great Feeling, Task Force, The Inspector General, On the Riviera, Hans Christian Andersen, Knock on Wood, where he played three different people in 1954, White Christmas, The Court Jester, uh, Mary Andrew, Me and the Colonel, The Five Pennies on the Devil, The Man from the Diners Club, The Mad Woman of Ch uh, Chalet. Um, and then here's where he gets into some of the uh, TV mo uh, a TV series and a TV movie called Here Comes Peter Cottontail. Oh, yeah. He did a voice in that. Uh, so... He, he, he voiced Seymour S. Sassafras, Antoine, and Colonel Welkington B. Bunny, the, uh, the voices, and here comes Peter Co uh, Cottontail. And then he uh, played in a 1976 version of Peter Pan as Captain Hook and Mr. Darling. Um, he played in a TV uh, movie... Uh, called Pinocchio, which that I do believe I have, and he played Geppetto. Um, and uh, um, who else did he uh, uh, play? I'm looking. Uh, let's see, yep, um, Boris Stroganoff. And then, uh, and then, of course, he play, uh, played in the 1985 Twilight Zone t uh, series as uh, Gasper in a segment called Paladin of the Lost Hour uh, before he played in the Cosby Show, which was his last performance. Uh, oh, and he played in that Skokie movie uh, called Max Feldman. But I guess he didn't have as much of a, a film career as I thought he did, but... I know he was in some memorable ones. <laughs> hmm. He he was definitely talented uh, and uh, extremely uh, um, had, had an extremely good voice. What do you think? Well, he did. He was. Uh, <laughs> he, he, he was pretty good. Uh, I think uh, that's. All that we ha have for today, folks, though. So um, thank you for listening to our babbling on about this uh, uh, film. But yeah. there, there was quite a, a few daydreams that we didn't entirely describe, but, uh, but, uh, uh, but that's okay. You know, we don't want you to know everything.
<laughs> yeah, one thing I realized is that uh, throughout this entire discussion, we've never said the uh, spoiler alert. Uh, like well, we usually ladies do. and gentlemen, uh, spoiler <laughs> alert um, for those who don't want to want to hear anything. Buck out, uh, buck out before you get uh, too far into this conversation. <laughs> Just basically yeah. use this as a companion piece to the movie. So, yeah. in any case, sharpen your ears. Tune in next time for the uh, the other secret life of uh, Walter Mitty. Uh, next week, same bet channel, same time. So... <laughs> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Have a great day, evening, or morning, wherever you are. And yeah. uh, don't daydream too much. <laughs> you might want to go on that green light. <laughs> uh, so thank you for listening and enjoy. Yeah, thank you for listening. <laughs>